Hello, everyone. This is Arcacia with Apache, and I'm here tonight with Cindy West. She is one of our 2021 convention homeschool speakers for our Stand Firm convention. So we're really excited to have her here tonight. Good evening, Cindy. How's it going? Good evening. It's going really well. I cannot wait to come visit you guys soon. Oh, we're excited about it. a little over a month away and our convention will be here. <laughs> yes. So let's just go ahead and get started uh, with this interview, Cindy. So why don't you tell us, I mean, I familiarized myself a little bit with you and I've heard a, um, a couple of your talks, but why don't you just tell, give us a little bit of your background and a little bit about your family life, just for the people who have not heard of you. Sure. Well, I think that if I have calculated correctly, I am in my 19th year of homeschooling, which I just should be an encouragement to everybody that you can do this and you can survive um, and it works. So I've graduated two of my three and they are completely successful in college and in real life. Um, so yeah, I'm not doing a grand experiment anymore. And um just trust yeah, me. Yeah, when you get works. that first one graduated, you like breathe a sigh of relief because you're like, oh, I didn't fail. Yes. <laughs> Especially when you see that there is success on the other side and, right. and you didn't, you really didn't fail. Yeah. So let's see. Um, we live in Kentucky. And like I said, three kiddos, I'm still homeschooling one. He is in eighth grade right now. Uh, it's really nice to homeschool one. Um, I'm giving him some cool attention that maybe the others didn't necessarily get. And they tell me sometimes <laughs> about it. I'm like, you know, there are perks to being the baby sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, what else? Let's see. I used to teach in the public school, um, before I came home to homeschool, but we have homeschooled all the way through and, I have loved, I will not say that I have loved every single minute of homeschooling, but I will say that every single minute has been worth it. And it's been full of joy and it's been full of peace because we knew that the mission to do this was a good mission. And so the bad moments can just be far outweighed by the good stuff. That's good. That's good. Because, you know, as homeschoolers, we are going to have those trials because everything's not going to be perfect. And it's lasting through those trials and realizing that, you know, you can do this. And even though the trials come, we can focus on God. We can have God carry us through and we arrive at the other side. <laughs> Absolutely. And he gives us what we need to make it through those difficulties as mm -hmm. well. Definitely, if we're definitely. listening. Yeah. So you focus a lot on the Charlotte Mason style learning. Um, you'll be doing a workshop during convention on the Charlotte Mason style. For those new to homeschooling out there, can you give us a brief description of what that is and how it looks in your homeschool? Well, I can try. It's um, it's kind of big to talk about, which is why we'll do a whole workshop mm -hmm. on it. But if I were to give you just um, a sentence or two, it is a very rigorous yet completely comfortable, loving um, cozy way to homeschool. We utilize shorter lessons. So, you know, instead of spending really long times on every single subject, we, we take the attention and we smush it down to short bits. And we ask our kiddos to really pay attention during those short bits. And we get a lot in, in a small amount of time. Um, nature studies, a part of it, living literature is a part of it. Um, habit training. Um, there's just, there's all kinds of things mm -hmm. that I could talk to you about right now, but in general, it's just this fantastic learning is life kind of mentality. And yet it's not at all a slackers kind of homeschooling style. Mm -hmm. It's very rigorous if you do it um, with zest. That's great. Great. You also mentioned there that uh, it involves some nature study. So with the pandemic going on, <laughs> a lot of our activities that we've had uh, been involved in have been canceled or they've been moved to virtual um, online formats, but nature, it's always out there. So yeah. this gives us an opportunity to get out there and study nature. What are some fun ways that we can actually do that? Oh, that's such a great question, especially 
you know, as we're talking about this in winter, that's, that's tough sometimes. Winter is hard. (laughs) Winter is hard. Fresh air, even the winter sunshine and a little bit of exercise can really rejuvenate your homeschool. So don't underestimate that power. Um, But some fun ways, just getting outside and observing things that you might not see up close normally because we're not out that often in the winter on a normal basis. So that's a really good thing to do. And your kiddos will be more excited because they're not outside all the time. So they'll notice new stuff. Um, But there's a lot you can do indoors too. So this Mm -hmm. season is a great season to maybe keep a daily chart of what you see outside your window. Um, how is the season beginning to change? Because we're starting to see slight changes that are little bitty hints towards spring. So every day you could keep a little calendar where all of your kiddos maybe draw a little picture or write some little notes and it could be about something new they see that day or a change they see or the temperature or, I mean, just really anything. Getting them in the habit of observing Um, You can also just sit around your kitchen table and do a little bit of indoor nature study where say um, you decide, you you can let your kids pick. That would be a fun way to do it. What do you want to learn about today? And you could grab either a field guide or a book that's on your shelf or even a YouTube video. And all of your kiddos could learn about that together. And then you pull out nature journals and everybody tries to sketch what you learned about. Oh, those I love those fabulous, ideas. <laughs> simple and they're fun and they can include everybody in your family too. That's right. A lot of that, what you just mentioned, we've been doing with my five-year-old because I have five kids. My oldest is 20 down to my youngest who's five. And it's been like a whole new homeschooling experience, homeschooling the youngest one now, which I love. And we've been focusing a lot on lab books. And so Ooh. I'll just ask her, what do you want to study? What do you want to learn about? And there'll be like one time she's like, well, I want to learn about animals. So we did a zoo yeah. lab book. And then this last week she said, well, I want to learn about sea turtles. So we pulled up some information about sea turtles. We reserved some library books about sea turtles and we just get really engrossed in it. And so I really love this opportunity to focus on the nature part, even though we're in the middle of winter and it doesn't yeah. necessarily <laughs> ideal to spend a lot of time outdoors when it's bitter cold out, but we still can get a lot of this stuff in, you know, and then you also mentioned outdoor activities just this past week, we had snow here and it's been the first really good snow that we've had. And so I was like, all right, kids, we're going to go outside and we're going to make snow angels. So for like the next hour, we just sat outside and we made snow angels and we compared the different sizes and we made them look weird and different things that they were doing. So it was just a great opportunity to have fun with the kids and just get them to get out there and experience more of life. Absolutely. And when you think about winter, we can get so cooped up and we've been really Mm -hmm. cooped up this year in particular, but in winter in general, the more we can infuse something that is different than the day-to-day, even if it's just going outside for an hour and making snow angels, it rejuvenates our souls and our minds and our bodies so that we can come back in and focus a little bit better. And I just want to mention exactly what you were talking about with your five-year-old. That's what I mean about homeschooling that baby. There's just something that interest-based learning, it's it's just okay. And it's wonderful. And Mm -hmm. there's so much goodness that comes out of it. We've definitely been enjoying a lot more this time. And I've actually noticed that my learning style and the way she learns too has changed a little bit from what I homeschooled the older kids. I mean, I still have older ones I'm homeschooling right now, but I'm noticing that I'm gearing more towards a classical style education with her. And I don't mind. I enjoy it. (laughs) It gives me new opportunities and new opportunities. And so it's It's been really fun you as well as the homeschool mom it's like a new challenge for you because we can get bored sometimes ourselves that's true (laughs) so you mentioned um and some of your talks about living literature and i know that um, we have a lot of new homeschoolers um so i wanted to kind of talk about this subject a little bit so that people can kind of understand what that is so can you give us some examples of what living literature is for our new homeschoolers who might be interested in a charlotte mason style approach Sure. So living literature is something that um, you, you think about a book that draws you in, that kind of places you in, you almost feel as if you are a character in this time and space with 
the people, with the other characters or the other character. Um, it uses rich language, rich vocabulary, and just really well written. So um, the opposite of living literature is twaddle. And one way I like to describe this is think about the old Dick and Jane books. Mm -hmm. um, this is Dick, this is Jane, they are walking. I, I don't even know what they said anymore. Versus a book that is, this is Dick and Jane. They love to walk in nature. And every time they go into nature, they find something new. So you can kind of see the difference there where all of a sudden you are invested in, well, what did they find in nature? Mm -hmm. Rather than just hearing the boring part of the, the, the words. Um, there is a place for Dick and Jane kind of writing when you're teaching a child to read. But when we're talking about actually being immersed in reading or reading aloud to our children or the books that they listen to on audio, we want those books to be rich. Um, mm -hmm. Typically, the classics, like the, and I would, I would say the older model, Caldecott, Newberry winning mm -hmm. books. And the reason I say older is because the newer ones can often have um, some of the newer issues. I'm trying to be very, mm. <laughs> very careful with my words. Some I of understand. the issues that our, that our world is struggling with, sometimes right. those those books will win those awards um, mm -hmm. these days. But if you go back to the old classics, then you're getting a picture of what the really good rich picture books and chapter books should look like. Those will give you great examples to start with. I know this year my kids have been really enjoying, uh, we have a hundred books that we're trying to master um, on our list. And some of the books that they've been enjoying is but like Jules Verne and um, yeah. Mysterious Island and Uncle Tom's Cabin and Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry. Those have been some great uh, opportunities for discussion too, um, when we're yes. actually reading them and, and doing our read alouds too. So they have a list that they accomplished and then a couple of them on that list, I will be like, well, let's do this as a read aloud and I'll read it to you. They, they tease yeah, me a lot sure. because some of the other books that have like the um, Southern lingo in it, I, I'm a Southerner. I don't know if you can tell that or not, but I was I was raised in the South, and so when I'm reading those books with the Southern twang, my Southern twang comes out, and so they get they get I a huge it. kick out of it. Yes. <laughs> they think it's hilarious that Mama has a Southern accent. <laughs> I actually love to use audio books when mm. there is um, when there's a book where it's really important that the different twangs or whatever um, come in. You know, like if you're mm -hmm. reading a good English book, like The Railway Children or something like oh, that, yeah. it's fun to listen to those on audio because listening to them with the different types of speaking is actually another really good skill for, I mean, just in general in language skills, it causes them to listen better. Mm -hmm. It causes them to have to understand the language better because it might be a little different even wording whether it's the um, the accent that somebody's using or not. Right. So yeah, you're, you named some really great books and there are really great picture books that are living picture books too. Um, think about the story of Ping, um, how to see the world and make an apple pie. Those are just a couple that come mm -hmm. to mind. We're, we're really invested in the storyline and good yeah. rich language. Definitely. One of those, uh, you mentioned audiobooks too. We had actually just finished a few weeks ago, The Screwtape Letters by C.S. Lewis. Oh, and mm -hmm. we listened to the Focus on the Family um, dramatized version of it. That was fantastic. We loved it. It is fantastic. And I've tried reading that book a few times myself. and I just can't get past all of the vo huge vocabulary in it and the different mm -hmm. um, scenes that when it interchanges scenes. But when we switched to the audio version, we were able to grasp it a lot more. And that was just a really enjoyable experience that my kids and yes. I had with it. That one was a fantastic book. I definitely recommend that one. <laughs> I recommend that one too. And in fact, the Focus on the Family audio um, radio theater, I think they call it, they have The Hiding Place Ooh. and Bonhoeffer as well. And so we're getting ready. We're just now jumping into World War II era yeah. and we're listening to both of those on tape. And so fact, the Bonhoeffer one, letters? is that the one by Eric Metaxas or is that a different one? Um. I actually am not positive about that, but it is the story of Bonhoeffer. Of course, The Hiding Place is the story of 
that's Corey Tim Boom, right? Yep, Corey Tim no. Boom, yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Um, so anyway, it's it's not their actual memoirs, mm -hmm. but it is more put to um, a little bit of a drama, kind of sort of an abridged version, but it's it's still really, really good, or they are still really good. Well, I definitely have to check into that. So let's move it on here. So do those mamas who, I mean, we've talked about a lot of um, Sherman Mason, we talked about living books, talked about audio books, we've talked about different learning styles. So those mamas who feel like they have to do it all, <laughs> I was one of those, <laughs> and they have no time for the fun stuff. What would you say to them to give them a little bit of an encouragement? So, I mean, there are a couple of ways you can think about this. Um, would you reiterate just a little bit about what you mean, particularly when you say do it all? So, you know, the, they have a checklist. They're like, okay, we got to do math. We got to do English. We got to do science. So, you know, we got to make sure we put this and that in. Um, electives, if you want to put some electives in there. And pretty soon it just becomes a list of things that they're checking off to get done. And then you got the housework in there and then, you know, husband and all that kind of stuff. And they, they can get overwhelmed easy. I was yeah. one that okay. was a very organized person <laughs> and mm -hmm. I had my checklist and I wanted to make sure I checked things off every single day. And it, it became to me like early on in our homeschooling where I realized that homeschooling was no longer enjoyable to me. It just became one of those things that I needed to cross off my list. And yeah. so I yeah. want to give some encouragement to those moms who feel like, well, if I don't do this, I'm going to fail my kids. But at the same time, there has to be some balance in, yeah. in what we do. And so we want to give some encouragement to those moms who kind of may be struggling in that a little bit. Okay, so I have three practical ideas. I hope I remember all three of them. <laughs> um, the first is, you know, I mentioned the Charlotte Mason style of homeschooling, where we naturally are pushing towards shorter lessons with a really good focus on each one of those lessons. And that, that doesn't actually mean we do less. It means that we get a lot accomplished in a shorter amount of time. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing you could consider. Um, don't feel like you have to consider that though. That was just something that popped in my mind that we'd already discussed. A second thing that's very practical is as much as possible, and it's not always possible because there are large age gaps in families, but as much as possible, especially in the sciences and the histories, and sometimes even in the language arts and math um, or foreign language or something like that, try to incorporate as many children at once into that as possible. Oh, that's a great That's going to save, yeah, a lot of time in doing five sciences a day versus mm -hmm. maybe I can take an older kiddo group and we can all be focusing on the same thing and the younger kiddo group and focusing on the same thing. In one way, you can make sure that you don't leave out gaps when thinking about that is um, follow a cycle. And mm -hmm. so, you know, you mentioned that you're starting to move more into a classical style of education that fits in with that style, but it, you don't have to fit in with the style. Just think of it this way. Every four years or every six years, you want to kind of move through all the different sciences and all the different histories. Mm -hmm. And so let's pretend like we're going on a four year cycle. The first year for history, let's learn about everything ancient history. The second year, let's learn about everything Middle Ages and, and um, maybe even into the Reformation. The third year, let's learn about modern, uh, early modern world history, you know, like um, the explorers and all the, the United States, the beginnings, the very, very beginnings of the United States. And then the fourth year, we're going to start maybe at the, the Civil War and after and kind of hit the more modern world mm -hmm. history. And so in that four year cycle, the, the very next year, that fifth year, you're coming back to ancients. So even if you're kind of pulling all of your kiddos together, you know that they're still all going to hit almost everything, at least mm -hmm. two or three times through, through their homeschool career. So it doesn't really matter if you necessarily start them at a certain grade at a certain thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then my last piece of advice to help the mama who thinks she has to do it all. Um, you know, you were talking about a checklist. I switched from a checklist a long time ago to, there's a couple of ways you can do it. The first, I have blocks. And so I have a math block 
I have a language mm-hmm. arts block. I have a science block. I have a history block. Um, sometimes I have a science and history block so that I can just fill in any day what we have done. And I don't feel pressure. Let's go to language arts. I don't feel pressure that we have to do spelling and grammar and writing and handwriting and um, whatever. You can continue mm-hmm. naming all of those. Right. I don't feel like we have to do those every single day. I can say, okay, we've, I filled in three things for this day. Let's move on. That is really, really good. And by the end of the year, even if you're not doing every single thing every single day, if you're being really persistent with each one of those, mm-hmm. your kiddos move so many steps forward in each one mm-hmm. of those things. Um, and That's then I mentioned you know, like science and history. Sometimes I have that in one block because I don't put pressure on myself to do science and history every single day, especially in the earlier years. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so I can, if I fill in that block with something, I can feel really, really good about that day. Right. So just a few practical suggestions. I'm sure we could talk for a really long time about some others, especially if we had questions coming in, like, well, what about this? Or what about right. this? <laughs> I definitely like that, uh, like that block time uh, theory, because we've actually moved into our block times where um, we don't do so- every subject every single day. Like, um, Tuesdays and Thursdays, those are our science days. So we only cover science on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And it has helped alleviate a lot of pressure on my kids and on myself too, when we've done that. And they've actually enjoyed it more. And they tend to learn more when we're focusing, like you said, small chunks of time on different things. So they really definitely appreciated that. (laughs) Yeah. And that's one of the philosophies you can say sort of, of the Charlotte Mason method that when they're not having to just continually pound, 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 and spend long amounts of time on everything, there is a freshness to the attention span. Mm -hmm. And that freshness is not only the attention span, but in the invigoration of the learning. Mm -hmm. So in, in spinning, like you said, Tuesday, Thursday on science or, you know, history or, or vice versa, then they know, okay, so this is history day. I don't get to do this every single day. Right. And so it gives them a freshness and really you as well. Definitely, definitely. (laughs) Well, thanks for those thoughts, Cindy. So my last question for you is, um, you've attended and spoke at several different conventions. So to our listeners that are watching us and who may may be to be tuning in later to watch this video, what would you say to them if they asked you, why should I attend a homeschool convention? Mm, That's a good question. When I was first homeschooling, I had a co-op, I had friends, but I was still very unsure of myself as a homeschooler and, and not only unsure of myself, but I didn't realize that I necessarily needed a shot in the arm. And so I would show up to a homeschool convention and I would be so encouraged, not only that I was doing an okay job, but I was given fresh ideas. I, mm. It was like new breath was breathed into me, not just in the talks that I heard, but in the hubbub of all of the people being around and just being like, I am not alone in this. Our little co-op is not the only co-op in our state or in this particular state. There are a lot of people doing this and everybody's excited about it. And then on another angle of that, it allowed me the opportunity to talk to experts, to talk to people who had been doing this for a long time and to get my hands on curriculum. Mm. Because especially in this day and age, we don't have homeschool bookstores to go to anymore. I used to have a couple of those where I could go and flip through different things. Right now I'm at the mercy of looking online, seeing sample chapters and really crossing my fingers and hoping they'll work. And there've been many times that I've been at a homeschool convention, even recently where I'm like, okay, I'm pretty sure I want this curriculum. And then I thumped through it and I'm like, oh, you know, now that I'm seeing the whole thing in front of me, Mm -hmm. I know that one's not going to work for us, but this one I never would have expected. And it now looks perfect. So, I mean, there's just lots of reasons to attend. Yep. Those are all good tips. And you mentioned not having the brick and mortar schools or stores anymore. I, we do, we don't have those brick and mortar stores. My parents live in Oklahoma and they have what's called Mardell's. It's a bookstore and they sell homeschooling curriculum at the bookstore. 
every time I go there, I have to shop Marnell just because I don't have that opportunity normally back in Illinois. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <What> I mean? <laughs> that's wonderful. I don't think we have those either. So there's definitely a treat to being able to see that curriculum in person to be able to look it over and make sure that it's going to be a good fit for yeah. your family and for your kiddos. Well, let me tell on myself really quickly. <laughs> so <laughs> probably my second year of homeschooling and I was so needing the perfect history curriculum. And if you've never been to a homeschool conference before, there are booths. And so, you know, there, there will be my booth at this homeschool conference. And then next to me will be someone else's booth and then someone else's booth. So I was so into thinking about history curriculum and look, I'd looked at several at this one booth and I knew there was another one over here and I carried off some curriculum <laughs> and somebody came and tapped on my shoulder and said, well, were you planning to buy that or not? I was so embarrassed <laughs> because it's wonderful. <laughs> it's this wonderful atmosphere and it's open. And of course I was not intending on it. Right. Taking it. it was the comparison thing for me, but it, <laughs> it was really embarrassing. Don't do that. You guys, <laughs> <laughs> people will wonder about you. Look, I'm turning red. <laughs> well, that's great that you open up like that because that puts the less pressure on our attendees. So if they make yes, this big yeah. or something, <laughs> they're like, well, Cindy West, <laughs> at least it wasn't in that situation. <laughs> you know, oh, mercy. But it brings us so much joy when we can kind of look back and chuckle at some of our mistakes that we've had and that we can learn yes. from them. They're just great opportunities. <laughs> <too>. <laughs> Well, Cindy, we want to thank you for joining us tonight. And as a reminder, our convention registration is open. So you guys can go to our website, which is ApacheCentralIllinois.org to register. And we're going to be doing some weekly uh, giveaways. We've already done a few here, but we are so you are graciously donating a nature study for us to give away. So we're going to be giving that away in a couple of weeks here. So go on to our website and register for convention. And you guys might be one of those winners. You could even walk away with Cindy's nature package. <laughs> Wouldn't that be awesome? <laughs> Thanks, Cindy, for joining us tonight. Oh, I'm so glad. I'll see you guys very soon.